decades earlier and that. And so, uh, yeah, I think you're just kindred spirits. Uh, speaking of kindred spirits, uh, welcome to the Big Questions Podcast, where we talk about love, death, sex, religion, and all the big questions worth asking. I'm your host, Robert K. Elder, and today we're talking with Dustin Lance Black. He's a writer, producer, and director, uh, and he's at Elmhurst College, where he's presenting Harvey Milk, Proposition 8, and Me. In 2009, Black won the Academy Award for his screenplay for Milk, the film starring Sean Penn as gay rights icon Harvey Milk. The Big Questions is sponsored by Sure, purveyors of professional microphones and headphones. Check them out at Sure.com. That's S-H-U-R-E.com. And the Big Questions podcast is part of the Sun-Times Media Local Podcast Network. Uh, Dustin, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> hey, so in your, your latest play, uh, Eight, which is based on the court transcripts from the court battle over Proposition Eight, which is the, the anti-gay marriage bill in California, it was impossible to get those transcripts, right? Like, they, like they, they were sort of like locked down for a while, right? Well, it was impossible to see what went on in the courtroom or hear uh, a recording. In fact, the um, opposition to marriage equality uh, fought all the way to the Supreme Court to make sure cameras were not allowed, even though the judge in the case had allowed them. And that, that was a possibility at the, at the, at the uh, district court mm -hmm. where the case was being heard. And uh, so that was impossible. You could get the transcripts. In okay. fact, they were being fed out each day. It's just they're incredibly dense. And, uh, you know, three weeks of, of, of testimony and all the pretrial hearings. I mean, there are just dozens, if not hundreds, of binders worth of transcripts. So, uh, you know, much of your career has been uh, not just arts-oriented, but, mm -hmm. act, you know, activism-oriented as well. Um, but but why this? This seems to be, you know, a particularly Herculean undertaking. You're doing mm -hmm. sort of the, the, you know, gay rights inherit the wind, basically. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, in full disclosure, I'm, I'm one of the founders of the case against Proposition 8. So I'm yeah. one of the founding board members of the American Foundation for Equal Rights. Um, and, uh, you know, I, as, a, as a civil rights historian, uh, I know and I've learned uh, from the, the giants whose shoulders I stand on, not just in the gay rights movement, but women's rights, black civil rights, all of it, storytelling is the most critical piece of creating the understanding necessary to move the conversation forward, to change legislation, to make safer spaces, more equal uh, spaces for folks. And here the opposition was clever enough to know that this first time they'll ever have to go into a federal court and raise their right hand to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but, uh, they're afraid of what that story will be. They're afraid of the stories that our, our, uh, our experts and our plaintiffs are going to tell. And, uh, and so I, as a... I thought, uh, along with Broadway Impact, which is this great group that came out of Broadway, um, CARES, uh, which was such a big supporter during the AIDS crisis, and they were sort of looking for something new. And uh, together we said, hey, let's, let's tell the opposition we're not going to put up with it. You can't continue to silence us. And a film takes three years or four years or five, mm -hmm. and uh, a play you can do in months. So I, I said, all right, I, I just took a binder with me on the airplane rides when I was doing J. Edgar, and I would just redact out the, the best points each side made um, and, and tried to be incredibly fair at picking those points and, and then did interviews with the plaintiffs to be able to personalize it a bit. But really, I wanted people to be able to experience what happens when both sides are forced to tell the whole truth and nothing but. And at the end of the day, you get to make your own decision. Uh, it doesn't go so far as uh, the judge's verdict even. Um, I mean, now I think it's clear right. to everyone because people are getting married again in California right. what the verdict was. But, but yeah, in that way, I've always said uh, homophobia is about misconceptions and the way to fix it is tell your story. And, uh, and so I... I, I used what I know, and I and I, I tried to do that a bit. Well, and uh, again, it's this uh, uh, amazing play that that people can see uh, actually on YouTube, and yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, and it's got you know Brad Pitt and um, uh, who are the other people on it? George Clooney, George Clooney. and and, and uh, Martin Sheen and. Uh, oh gosh! It's, now you're gonna make me blind. No, no, but, you no, know, but it's, it, it's there's so many people. I I forgot them. It's it's Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon, Kevin Bacon is in there. John C. Uh, Riley is Riley. amazing in it. Yeah, it's a it's a shabby cast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised anyone showed up. But 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 no, it's it, you know it's amazing. It's played in all 50 states now, and again yes. that that YouTube uh, uh, version of that show is played all over. And uh, I my interpretation of this is you are doing this uh, so you can be, and you can provide flat platforms. 
uh, like Harvey Milk did. So you have a very personal story about how Harvey Milk changed your life. Can you tell that briefly? Sure. I mean, I grew up in a uh, very conservative Mormon home, uh, a military home. Uh, I was out in San Antonio, Texas, so I wasn't even near other Mormons. I was very different than everybody. And I also knew that I was gay from a very young age. And, um, you know, it's uh, we're not taught in this country uh, that difference is valuable, uh, especially where I come from. And we're taught that it's a bad thing. And we're taught to fear it. And, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and I, I think I learned from so many of my mentors that sort of fear was the way. And they led by fear whether it was politicians uh, that I grew up with or military folks or even the teachers, the principals of my high school, you know, with her giant sprayed up hair and paddle with the holes drilled in it. And, and, and literally it was by, it was just a turn of luck that my stepdad got uh, transferred to Fort Ord, which was in California. And that my mom wanted to break me of my shyness problem. And she didn't know it was, that being gay was a big part of that. But she put me in theater classes and I liked them, not surprisingly. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it was there that I heard a speech by a guy named Harvey Milk. And he was giving that speech in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, it would have been when I was four years old. And he talked in that speech. I heard just the recording of it. He talked in that speech about uh, coming out and sending a message of hope uh, by doing that to young people that there are alternatives to taking your own life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and you know, it was the first time in my life that I ever heard anyone leading with hope instead of fear. I didn't even know that was possible. It's the first time I ever heard of some, an out gay person. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that was possible. You were four? No, at this point, I'm like 14, 14 so it was 10 14. years later. Oh, okay, so okay. he gave the speech when I was four. I heard it. I didn't hear it until I was 14 or 15 okay, okay. once we moved to California. And, uh, yeah, sorry. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, and, 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 and also his brand of hope and his brand of leadership was actually about me. Mm. It included me. And so you can imagine how revelatory that moment was for me. I didn't know you could be out. I didn't know you could lead with hope instead of fear. And I didn't know there was anyone out there fighting for people like me. Right. And, well, and now you are one of those figures. You know, you're very public. You're very, you know, progressive. You are leading with hope. Um, uh, I think uh, Dan Savage is another figure doing that you know, with his uh, It Gets Better campaign. Yeah. Uh, who are the other folks out there? You know, maybe just on the horizon who are pushing that agenda for who, who are sort of icons of the future, who are helping push that message? Oh, my goodness. I mean, there are so many people in the gay and lesbian movement. And I'll tell you right now, uh, we don't always agree. Mm. We don't necessarily often agree. Uh, you know, I, uh, I work closely with, um, folks like Chad Griffin, who helped create, uh, the American Foundation for Equal Rights. He now runs HRC, which is funny because neither of us could stand HRC Mm because they were so sort of, you know, incremental at the time, uh, you know, six years ago. And, 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 but, you know, there's also people out there whose shoulders I stand on. Uh, you know, there's the Evan Wolfsons of the world out there who've been fighting for marriage equality since I was a tiny little kid. Yeah. Since before anyone, th- everyone thought he must have been mad. Marriage. Like, that's the opposite of what many gay people thought being gay was. You know, they did, the two things they didn't want to do was go into the male military or ever get married. They wanted peace, anti-war, and to break down the patriarchy and, you know, what they saw marriage was. And, and you know... And since that time, we've learned that love and relationship is really valuable. Family is valuable mm-hmm. and that we need access to those rights and protections. I, I, you know, there's a lot of young people who are coming up in the ranks uh, uh, to, uh, you know, from the groups like Get Equal. And, and frankly, it's been really heartening to watch them. Uh, it's, it's almost as if an entire generation was missed. You know, a lot of people in their 30s. In early 40s, didn't seem to do much in the movement, but I'm seeing people in their teens, 20s, and 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 early 30s, sort of skipping that and, and holding hands with uh, and and looking for, uh, you know, inspiration from people like Cleve Jones, mm. who are in their 60s, people in their 70s, and it seems like when you watch the March on Washington a few years back, there was this great, uh, you know, cooperation between people in their 20s and people in their 50s and. Well, and in becoming this this figure, you know, you you you've you know crafted this this uh, I think very honest media persona of yourself. You know, you you are what you stand for. But did you ever think you would become that person for your brother? That was a fascinating story. Oh. Uh, did, did did you think you inspired him? Um, like you needed to be inspired? 
Uh, I, you know, my brother came out to me while we were making milk. I assume that's what you mean. Yeah. Uh, I know. Probably, I probably he I like ruined it for him. I don't know. He might have come out sooner if I hadn't, you know, done it the way I did it. It's probably hard to come out in a family like mine where I'm out there doing the things I'm doing. Um, you know, it 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 certainly made. I was very surprised at first because this is a you know this is a guy who proudly defined himself as a redneck uh, and uh, loved. NASCAR and loves killing animals for fun and all that sort of thing. And, um, and, uh, you know, just, it wasn't any of the stereotypes, but, you know, it quickly made sense. I, it made sense why, you know, he hadn't had a girlfriend in 10 years mm -hmm. and he's a handsome guy. Uh, so, uh, but no, I, you know, I, I, I think perhaps it was helpful. I hope it was helpful that I could, you know, uh, let him know that he wasn't alone out there and, and to, to, you know, he moved in with me pretty quickly. I mean, I, I took him out to places like West Hollywood and, you know, mostly he was just asking me, Hey, where are the gay people like me? Where are the gay people who like the, the to, gay NASCAR circuit, the gay NASCAR <laughs> circuit who like Budweiser? I was like, all right, we'll find them. Yeah. I was gonna say, and where are they? <laughs> I'm probably watching NASCAR races. I don't know. And, um, the 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 marriage equality movement seems to have gained a lot of momentum mm -hmm. um you know so is the projection is it is it 20 years until sort of it's an even playing field i don't think so uh i mean i don't think so i think it's uh i think we're going to see it very soon um i think uh you, you know we're it, we're going into court again, meaning the American Foundation for Equal Rights. We're at, uh, in circuit court again in Virginia mm. um, uh, on Tuesday. And, uh, you know, and, and how many states, there's so many states right now who've gone to federal court, done the same thing that we did in California with our case. You know, Utah, Texas, Oklahoma, Virginia. I mean, it's just state after state after state, Michigan. Um, you know, uh, at, at some point, the Supreme Court knows it can't continue to kick this can. Uh, at some point, there may be disagreement at the district court level, at the I mean, at the or at the circuit court level, and uh, and they'll have to step in. Um, and and I think it's clear where they stand. I think it's clear from what they've written so far what, in the decisions that came out last July. Um, and I also think the American public has made it clear how they feel. Uh, you know, it's it's an undeniable majority of people in this country now favor marriage equality. Uh, there's even polls now that a majority of people in the South favor marriage equality. Um, it's I think because people are coming out. And it, so, is it two years? Is it five years? What is it? What do you think? I think we're about four years and three months. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. Four years and two months. Let's put that on. No, the schedule. I, I actually, I actually think it's probably sooner than that. Frankly, I think we're probably about uh, two years and two months away. Great. If I really actually had to guess, if I had to wager, I think that might be it. But uh, but I could be completely wrong, and it could be one year and two months away. This this they they could take the case up, uh, one of these cases up that uh, that's out there right now, and, mm -hmm. and and that could be the decision. And I do want to come back a little bit because I know you're working with ABC and you have some other projects. But I, I want to keep uh, talking about just these civil rights issues, and that is so once that is settled law. Mm -hmm. What's the next big civil rights battle? Like, what's on the, you know, what 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 what's next? Well, I, you know, I I I think you know, marriage is one thing, but there are still the majority of states in this country. You can be fired for being gay or lesbian, LGBT. Uh, you can lose your, be kicked out of your home if you're an LGBT person, and it's completely illegal. Uh, people don't talk about it. But it's true. And, and what that does, it doesn't just mean people are losing their jobs and being kicked out of their homes, which happens. For the most part, what it means is people are having to live their lives in silence. Mm. Uh, it means that people aren't able to talk about their partner at work or bring them to the parties. It means children of gay and lesbian couples have to keep their families secret at school. Can you imagine the damage that does to the self-esteem of those parents and of those kids? Uh, and so, you know, I've said I, I beat the drum, uh, you know, very loud saying I, I, I am for marriage equality. Uh, I'm fighting for that. I put my time and my money into it, but uh, but I still think that in many places, uh, employment and housing non discrimination is the most critical part of this. Because if civil rights fights are about telling your story, we have to create atmospheres in which people can do that without losing their home or their job. So I still think that's a critical piece that has to be finished. And and that, interestingly enough, might not be finished. Um, we might have marriage equality before people can safely keep their jobs. Yeah. 
Well, and uh, so do you believe in marriage equality, not just for everybody, but for you? And, I, and I'm asking this because I know you just moved in with your boyfriend in London. And I had heard that you are uh, uh, going to film a, a romantic film in London. So uh -huh. romance is in the air. So do you believe yeah. in it for you? I just like that you're blushing right now. I think uh, it's these <laughs> lights. I think it's these lights. Yeah. Uh, uh, do I believe in, in marriage, marriage for me? You. Do you want to be Oh, married? yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up Mormon, man. Like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Like, I'm, you know, I, I only believe in marriage between two people because I've but not like some of my Mormon brethren. Right. Uh, but, because because you, you started as a, a writer on Big Love as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, uh, you know, but yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I want kids so badly and I do, I didn't have this the entire time I grew up. You know, I had a, my father took off when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I had a stepfather who was not a great experience, pretty rough experience. And I knew what that was like and it was rough. It was horrible. And then around 13, my mom married one of the most amazing men in the world. Mm -hmm. And I got a taste of what it was like to have two supportive parents. And I know the difference and it's massive. And I, it's just something that I would love to have for my kids and I want a lot of kids <laughs> and uh, and so that means you know I, I think that marriage means a lot I think the word means a lot I think the promise to each other means a lot to the two people who enter into that promise but I think it also means a lot to the kids who can draw comfort that their parents have made this commitment to each other and that the world understands what it means so yeah I'm in <laughs> well, and, and uh, again, because I've heard about this project, I don't know if you want to talk about it, uh, this, this romantic film in London. It, it seems like you're in a very good place. So so what does romance in London mean to you? So, what is, uh, Well, I mean, this was a book, Statistical Probability of Love at First Sight. We're trying to figure out where to, when to shoot it. <laughs> and I'm not going to break the news of the cast here today, but it's cast. Okay. And, uh, and uh, you know, I yeah, it's a... Uh, it's, uh, I'm, you know, I, I can be a romantic guy. I, it doesn't always come across, I guess, in the films that I choose to do. Uh, but this was based on a Jennifer Smith young adult novel that one of the executive producers of Milk handed me. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, just read it. And if you can put it down, just, you know, don't call me again. And I read it and, and I thought, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. And it rang true. You know, I, it's, it, it rang true for me. And I spoke with Jennifer, who was the author of the book, and I thought she was fantastic. And we talked about ways that I could uh, make it appeal not just to the young people who read it and loved the book, but to an older audience as well. And it really addressed some of the issues of what is the science of love and how much does that matter? Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, so. And uh, another project is you're working with ABC. Um, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'll talk about. Uh, yeah, I mean ABC. I'm just I'm I'm crafting a uh, mini series on uh, the LGBT movement uh, from uh, the very early '70s until about uh, last year. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of all I can say. So, so is, is it their version of, uh, like, I remember the... They did Roots. The, or they did, the, the, like, the 80s and, like, the 70s. You know, is it one of yeah. those, like, multi-generational stories where... Yeah, I mean, it'll have to it'll have to go through all that. I can't yeah. tell you everything I'm going to do in it. Uh, also, because who knows? You know, it's new. It could change. But it's... Uh, but, yeah, sure. It covers that time and it covers a journey. And it also... Uh, it, it also sort of lets... It explores how other movements influenced the LGBT movement, yeah. how we don't just stand on the shoulders of LGBT leaders. We stand on the leaders of every civil rights movement in this country. We learned from them. Uh, we used their foot soldiers from the peace movement, the women's movement, and the black civil rights movement, uh, it's some of the same names and faces. Uh, and so it's 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 about that the interconnectedness of of equality and diversity in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask about one more future or pending project, uh, and that is uh, John Krakauer's uh, Under the Banner of Heaven. Yeah, you're getting uh, through him. Yeah, yeah, I was well, just on the phone yesterday with Ron Howard. We're like <laughs> we're getting close on that one. Well, and that you know because you were raised uh, LDS, that is a very controversial book. Yeah, like how is it even? Uh, you know, I, I can imagine the. Um, power it takes to push that to the screen because uh so, so so just talk about that because again you were raised mormon so is there any inner conflict about telling that story because it's a very controversial story no and i still i'm friendly with uh you know my mormon family mormon friends i'm in yeah. utah a lot working with him on equality issues i still go to the joseph smith center and consider some of the leaders in the church my friends mm -hmm. i mean uh i'm not a practicing mormon now um uh but 
and, and I don't agree with everything they have to say, but I agree with some of the, what they have to say, uh, you know. And, uh, you know, I believe in the golden rule and treating your neighbor the way you'd like to be treated and the importance of family and all of that. So we can see eye to eye on some things. Um, you know, I, and, and, uh, but I also experienced some stuff and, and that I want to talk about. And I want to talk about, um, you know, what religion can do, uh, for better and for worse. And the film does that. Um, and, 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 uh, you know, because I think, uh, and, and I can't really talk about other religions. I didn't grow up in them. I'd feel, it would feel false to me, but, uh, you know, I did, I did make sure and discuss the film with people from the church. Um, I went to the real people and, and talked with them. Um, I of course met and talked with John Krakauer. Um, but you know, I've given the church and folks who I care about and had every opportunity to say, Hey, that's not, I don't feel right about that. Or that depiction's not quite right. Um, and to listen and uh, learn. And so, you know, but at the end of the day, I think we have to take a, a good hard look at, uh, as we point fingers at religious fundamentalism abroad and, and the bad that comes of it. Um, and there is a lot of bad that comes from it, um, from, uh, you know, uh, inhumane, uh, self-oriented religious fundamentalism. I think we also have to take a look at ourselves mm. and we don't always do that. And to say, hey, you know, we're, we're pointing the finger, but look around and, and look at how um, when people use the name, the word of God uh, for selfish reasons, look at what happens just right here in this country. So that's really what it looks into. Yeah, I was going to say, well, even here in the state, because in, uh, you know, Nauvoo, Illinois is where Joseph Smith was, you mm -hmm. know, hunted down by uh, a mob and was, was killed. Sure. Um, you know, uh, it, it's a really sort of interesting, uh, you know, American story. And it's really interesting to see the iterations that um, that sort of cultural effect has taken. Now, you have Mitt Romney, mm -hmm. you know, running for president, but you have the Book of Mormon, which, you know, like runaway hit on Broadway. By yeah. The way, by, the, by the way, what'd you think? It's hilarious. And by the way, like my Mormon friends who are still active in the church are the ones who seem to laugh the hardest. I mean, well, it's all inside jokes for them. Yeah, this is really good jokes. They do little hand movement things that no one else gets unless you're Mormon. And it's kind of awesome, you know, and, uh, you know, it's like you got to be able to not take yourself too seriously sometimes. Uh, but it was, you know, I, I enjoyed the work I did on Big Love, but I had a lot more to say. And so this is my chance to say that. Yeah. And and um, uh, you've talked before about the value of, of of being different, and I love this line you have that that people are better when they're in love. So is that something that you you've been doing your research? Yeah, a like, little I, bit, I, I, a little right. bit, a little bit. So so what I want to know is is that something you observed or is that something you learned that that you experienced? Oh, I've seen it time and again. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I you know I've seen the way my mom changed when she fell in love. For the first, I think she kind of fell in love for the first time when she met my stepdad. You're making me blush again. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and you know, and I, I and I, you see the great change that comes over people. It's like love is this thing uh, that that for the most part only good comes from. So much good can come from love. It teaches you about empathy. It, it makes you less selfish. Um, and uh, and 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 frankly, you, for the most part, except for those days you have big fights, which happens, you're you know you're a happier person, and uh, and and you know it's it's one of the it's one of the few things in this world that feels good and is good for you and and good for other people. You can't say that about you know Oreo cookies, because <laughs> <laughs> as good as they are for you and other people, they're not probably your doctor's not going to approve. <laughs> I was going to say, if they could figure out how to package it. But a doctor is going to be like, go fall in love. It's good for stress, usually, <laughs> you know, best case scenario. Um, and so you're, you're, you're doing this tour. You're talking about uh, Prop 8 and Harvey Milk. When you go out and you talk to folks, uh, so, I mean, how many stops? Like, is this just something you do intermittently or mm -hmm. is this a speech you give? So, so tell me about it. Is this a tour? How did it develop? Oh, yeah. I've been doing, I mean, I mostly make movies or, uh, you know, take states to federal court. Yes, yes. <laughs> this is a, it's a, it's a full, full schedule. Of late. Uh, but, you know, when I'm not doing that, I, uh, I I like to do these speaking tours. And so I do one um, in the, I, I ask my agents to put together a, a list in for the spring and for the fall. And uh, and usually a week or two, and I just cram them all in. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and it's, it's great because I get to sort of rewrite my life story and figure out how it applies to today every, like, you know, four or five months. And uh, so that's what I'm, I'm in the middle of that now. I'm not doing a massive one because I'm so busy with work, but sure. in the fall, I'm sort of doing a big 
two week thing. Sure. And and uh, Pasadena City College just recently asked you back. They they had sort of disinvited you yeah. to, to give the commencement address. And this all stemmed from uh, someone stole an intimate tape that you made with a boyfriend and made public. But what I'm interested in is one, what the hell is that address going to be about? <laughs> what is that address? Gonna be? Yeah, yeah, that's going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. And then did, did you you know what did you take away from such an invasion of privacy? Uh oh boy. Um yeah, it was horrible. It was horrible. It was something from a very long time ago. Um, uh, but, you know, that's exactly what it was. Uh, and uh, it came out of left field, I'll tell you that. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, but I, I will say it's like if someone invades my privacy, that's what they're going to find, yeah. uh, you know. And, uh, and uh you know, I just thought it was time to finally say I'm 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 just not going to be shamed by that anymore. I've I've never been dishonest about who I am, and uh, and frankly, I just wonder what some of the administration was up to and searching for late at night on the internet, <laughs> and what else they might be searching for late at night on the internet because this wasn't something that had come up for like half a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know, it might speak more to them than it does me. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know. Uh, but what my commencement speech there, I, I'm doing it for the kids. Like when I said yes the first time, I mean, it's not an easy thing to say yes to. I, I'm mostly in London these days and yeah. flying across the you know, world. And, uh, and, and so I did that because I was a student at Pasadena City College. Um, I was one of those kids who didn't have the money to go to a four-year school. I was accepted. I was supposed to go to USC. Couldn't afford it. And, uh, and so I decided to stay down in Southern California and I looked for a place that would give me the best shot to get to a four year school if I was lucky enough to figure out a scholarship or the money or whatever. And that was Pasadena City College. And, uh, I found it to be a great place, very supportive, great honors classes. I, I, I felt like I, I was getting a first rate education there. And there was a professor there who really helped me with my application to UCLA film school and, and encouraged me to make phone calls and be a pest, and and I got in. And, you know, they only allow in, I think, 15 or 30, I can't remember the number, of students a year into that film school. And, and so, it was, you know, I always had really, really fond memories of it. So I said yes, and I said yes because I wanted to, like, let those students know that they have, they've, they've got a really great start under their belt. And if they want to keep going and do a four-year education, uh, to go for it. And, uh, and and to to let them know some of my secrets of mm -hmm. how I turned a two year associate's degree into the career I have now, and and that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. Still, yeah. I, I'm I'm there for the students. I'm not there for the administration. They don't need my help. The administration, they well, might need someone else's help <laughs> at, at this point, but not mine. <laughs> but what was fascinating and just sort of watching this from the outside is it, it seemed to be something that could have been sort of scandal ridden and took you off message, but you seem to make it part of your message, which is. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting way. Well, this is an old story. I know. I know. But, this but, is an old story. But, it, but, but it, it, the way you were able to make it part of your message, to, mm -hmm. to sort of frame it. And what I want to know is, was that conscious? Like, no, I'm going to make this part of my march toward equality. I just really uh, like it's – it's. Uh, I just want to tell – I'm just telling the truth. Yeah. I, that's my thing. And, and I feel like – uh, you know, some, when you feel like things are getting murky and dark and confused, I always say, tell your truth, be honest, what's really going on, get to the bottom of it. I mean, this is where I always say, people say, well, where did you get the, you know, the sort of moral compass, uh, the willpower to fight for equal rights? And I say, I got it from growing up Texan, I got it from growing up in the military, and I got it from growing up Mormon. Yeah. Taught me to work hard, be honest, and get out there and fight for what you believe in. Now, it's funny that sometimes now I go head to head with the military <laughs> and with the Mormon church and with the South, <laughs> but I'm using the tools that I learned there. And so when I start getting beat up by somebody over at Pasadena City College, I'm going to get tough and I'm going to get honest and I'm going to shed light where there's darkness. I'm going to tell the truth when things get murky. And, and, and if I see ignorance, I say, tell the truth and that'll make, that'll make ignorance go away real fast. And I've, you know, I've talked to a, a lot of people who are, you know, social, social crusaders and, and that sort of thing. And I'm always interested in stories where telling them, telling the truth got them in trouble. Oh do you, yeah. Do you, do you, so, so do you, do you have one of those sort of like, Oh my uh, gosh, moments? telling the truth gets me in trouble all the time. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, everybody's on the federal, well, most people are on the sort of federal equality bandwagon now. Um, 
But f- five years ago, when I got up in front of the Academy Awards and I and I promised young kids across America that they'd have federal equality sooner than later, I caught hell uh, from leaders in the gay movement, hmm. uh, who I respect, by the way, greatly, uh, and still do. But I caught hell, and and but it, to me, that was my truth. That was what I believed to be true based on everything I'd read and studied in the gay movement and in the black civil rights movement and the women's movement was we had a it, we were at a moment, uh, this was the moment where we needed to act at the federal level, that we'd reached it. Now, and there's always hesitancy. Is it too soon to do that? And I just firmly believed it was the time, and a few of us did, and it got me in a ton of trouble. Uh, but you know, I, I I lean on a on a on a, on a old Harvey Milk quote. Uh, actually, first it was Julian Bond who said, um, uh, "Good things do not come to those who wait; they come to those who agitate." Hmm. And that gave me some strength. And he was, you know, a leader of the NAACP for a long time. And then the Harvey Milk quote, which went something like, uh, "It was when everyone was telling him it was too soon. He caught hell just for running for public office as a gay man." And same thing from gay leaders. And he said, "Masturbation can be fun." but it does not take the place of the real thing. It's time for the gay community to stop playing with itself and get down to the real thing. Hmm. Um, There are some who are satisfied with crumbs because that's all they think that they can get, when in reality, if they demand the real thing, they'll find that indeed they can get it. And and so I just leaned on those quotes and took the grief from my community. And and thankfully, you know, we did all right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it was was it because that that it was too forward and perhaps predictive? Like it's it's one of these things that I I think that is interesting, which is when somebody says something in public, and I think the New York Times Magazine just did this about Obama's changing, you know, stance on gay marriage. Mm-hmm. Like all of that seemed to be a domino effect. And so, um, is it part of your philosophy that you know this sort of thing creates momentum? And mm-hmm. the act of talking about it makes it happen. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I it, uh, no, I mean, it also takes a lot of hard work, you know, and uh, a lot of briefs. <laughs> yeah, a lot of briefs. But it also is like we were standing on the shoulders of some great people, you know, and uh, you know, they, a lot of work had come ahead. It, it wasn't like all of a sudden this was just the magic moment. It was okay. A lot of these people have put in a lot of work for a long, long time. And, uh, and now we're going to act. Unfortunately, they didn't agree that this was the time to act. It wasn't in their plan. There was more of a 25, 30 year plan, um, but, uh, in place for them. But, you know, uh, you know, we, we sort of stand on a lot of blood, sweat and tears on their part and a lot of blood, sweat and tears on our part. Um, and frankly, their judgment that we now was not the time and that it would fail and hurt us was good for us because it made us work harder. And, uh, and so I often say the disagreements in the gay movement are good for us. And, uh, I mean, if anything, we're seeing it again because Joe Becker, Pulitzer Prize winner, just put out a book about the Proposition 8 case. And, uh, she's catching hell from some of the leaders in the gay movement about it, uh, saying that, you know, not enough credit is being paid to this person or this founder or this person. And, and I, I can see that we, you know, a lot of these people are the reason that we are where we are today. Um, uh, but I, I say to the people who get very mad that anyone's mad, I say, these disagreements are good. We're going to, these disagreements in our community get us to look at ourselves, examine ourselves, look at what we're doing. Uh, do we need to reach out to other people? Do I need to reconsider that position? And maybe you still feel you're right, but you're going to work harder uh, at, at your the way you're working. Can you tell me about... Uh a disagreement uh, in that space where where you were wrong and you were shown to be wrong, but it was still helpful that it still pro- propelled I, you. I've actually never been. Wrong. I know. I, the, I I get the sense from I, your confidence, you, but, but no. I'm, oh my gosh! You're kidding me. Uh, no, no, very very confident. But it's one of these things that that I think um, you're absolutely right about. But I'm always wondered. I'm always wondering when we're on the other end of that. Mm. Like how many times I've been wrong? Not not when you've been wrong, but when you've had a, like a really heartfelt discussion that made you reconsider and and made you change your tack. Um. Uh. Sure. I mean, every every day that I'm writing. I mean. Uh, I mean, I can use that as an example. I, I'm not a very confident person when it comes to the any of the work I do. Uh, you, you could just say, I'm a writer. Like, yeah, that, that, there's I'm a, a shortcut for that. <laughs> yeah. No. So it's sort of like, I question everything. Every day I wake up and think I'm a failure. Every day I read the first draft of what I've written, whether it's a political idea or a script, and I go, this is crap. 
this is crap. This is derivative. Yeah. This is uh, I'm I'm wimping out. I'm borrowing that idea. I'm not looking at uh, where I need to be looking uh, to, to get to where I want to go. You know, I, yeah. I mean, that's every day, and 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 I certainly do both in my political work and in my 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 film work. I have the people who I trust who I let read my stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't on the phone with Ron Howard about under the banner of heaven yesterday because he was perfect. Yeah. Then he wouldn't need to call me. Yeah. You know, and uh, and certainly when I, you know, have an opinion about something politically that I would like to express, like to have out there, like to lead with, I go to the people who I trust and I even go to the people who often disagree with me and I say, what do you think of this? Uh, you know, before I put out the statement on Pasadena City College, I gave it to a couple friends and said, what do you think? And one in particular who I love said, do not put that out there. Mm -hmm. And I knew then that I had to put it out there. But I go to people... <laughs> <laughs> I go to people and I want their opinions. Yeah, sure. Well, and and uh, I'm interested what uh, – you just came from D.C., right? Were you visiting your mom? Yeah. Uh, and so what is uh, – you know, does she, does she read your scripts? What, what are – and especially, uh, of course, the we're talking about Under the Banner, Banner of Heaven. What have, what has the discussion been like between the two of you about that project? But, well, my mom's not active Mormon. Sure, anymore. sure. But uh, again, you're still part of the community. It's like I was raised Catholic. I'm never not yeah. going to be Catholic at some point. Um, I, she mostly just wants to read the script. Yeah. I haven't let her read the script yet. Oh. So, you know, she, uh, you know, my mom, my mom trusts me. I also don't, I'm not like an attack guy. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I, it's not even in my portrayal of, uh, frankly, I caught hell for portraying J. Edgar Hoover yeah. in too compassionate a fashion. Um, I, you know, in, in for Mil humanizing the boogeyman. Yeah. Well, I mean, and then, uh, in, um, in uh, Milk, you know, I, I certainly spent time looking into Dan White and trying to understand him as a human being. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing the same thing uh, in Under the Banner of Heaven. I'm, I'm not out there with an agenda to bring one person down and lift one person up. I'm out there uh, to try my best to tell the truth about a situation. And if somebody uh, comes off as someone to be admired, that's probably because they were. Uh, and maybe we find something you know, very human in them and empathetic in them and worthy of our admiration, but, uh, or the opposite. But I, you know, I, I think my mom trusts me that I'm not out there trying to ever hurt anybody. It's just not my, my way. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a good place to end. All right. So, uh, you've been listening to uh, the Big Questions podcast. Uh, our guest has been uh, Dustin Lance Black. Uh, our music is by Ernan Sanchez. Uh, Dustin, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.